Welcome. You're listening to Living Faith Podcast. Starry sky and see your hand in time in mind to lead me through the night. first message in this short series that I've been in. Today's the third message. The first was focused on the Lord's rest. Rest as opposed to weakness. Last week we talked about the Lord's peace. Peace, inner peace, as opposed to inner turmoil. In each case in these messages, our intent is not to criticize human attempts to help our condition, to improve our condition. Rather, our intention, our purpose, our point is that Jesus is supremely better than any solution humanity has to offer. Hands down, without question, now and always, Jesus Christ is better than Xanax. This week, Our topic is Lord's joy. The opposite end of the joy meter. Perhaps we would see sorrow or sadness. Between those two spectrums, joy at one end and perhaps sorrow, grief, sadness at the other end, there are other dimensions on that line. Perhaps we would see stages such as frustration on that line. We would see bitterness. Maybe just a little bit removed from joy, we would see some stagnancy, some dullness, some lack of inspiration. And my purpose today is to help us, to challenge us, to consider where are we on such a line? Where would we see ourselves on that spectrum of Joy, where we live in, what's been our life experience even this past week. Are we living in Jesus' better joy? Are we living there? And I, in my own concept and thinking and relating, I'm wondering in what ways do we engage and release the Lord's joy in our lives? I'm going to try to talk about that a little today. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament, they're companion books, and they chronicle the return of the Jewish people from exile in Babylon. They are returning back to their mother city, Jerusalem, that had been laid waste, destroyed, all the main structures leveled. The temple had been destroyed, Solomon's temple destroyed. And so Ezra's writing as a priest, and Nehemiah writes from the perspective of the governor. And so depending on the people that we're talking about and when they were taken captive, there were different waves of those taken captive into Babylon. But Ezra and Nehemiah recording this return, some of those folks could have been 70 years away from Jerusalem, 70 years away from their homeland. While they were in Babylon, they did what they could to follow the Lord and to follow his word, but it was nothing like the freedom that they had enjoyed as their own nation prior to captivity. And for those who were born in captivity, those less than 70 years of age, to come back to Jerusalem, their own holy city, and a place where they would establish uh, the right, the privilege of worshiping God and the fullness of his word. It's a whole new experience for that generation. So Ezra and Nehemiah record the happenings and what's taking place when they return to Jerusalem as they reinstitute some practices. In Nehemiah chapter 7, the last Verse of that chapter, verse 73, Scripture records, So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and some of the common people settled near Jerusalem. The rest of the people returned to their own towns throughout Israel. 
In October, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the water gate. That would be one of the gates in the protective fence or what used to be a protective fence around Jerusalem. They asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. And then verse 2 records, So on October the 8th, Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the assembly, and that assembly included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. There you go, early definition, Brother Noah, children's ministry. All the children old enough to understand. I'll just nose into your business again as parents a little bit. It's amazing how quickly our children learn and what they understand and appreciate. Let's make sure we give equal and exceeding time to the things of God. When they're able to sing to nursery rhymes at home, we should be encouraging them to sing hymns and to be involved in the house of God. When they're able to have gestures and hand gestures at home regarding a variety of things, it's good to encourage raising your hands. It's good to encourage how you stand before the Lord in worship. It's good as soon as they could understand to get them engaged in the things of God. It says in verse 3 that Ezra faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon. Now there's a substantial church service right there. And he read aloud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened closely to the book of the law. Man, that's a good day in the house of God. Verse 4 says, Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. And to his right stood, well, all of those people. <laughs> and to his left stood all of those people. In verse number 5, the scripture says, Ezra stood on the podium in full view of all the people. When they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. I want you to think about the moment. There's some people who had never had the freedom to hear the word of God in public discourse and presentation. Here's a group of people that had been subjected in captivity and any of their worship was hidden and cloistered and only as permitted. And now they stood in their own land. For what you and I might think would be boring hours of reading the word of God, but there they stood. As Ezra read the scriptures, recognizing some freedom and privilege and honor and incredible words and, free and joy that they had not had for some time. The Bible says, Ezra praised the Lord in verse 6, the great God and all the people chanted, Amen! Amen, as they lifted their hands. The Bible says, then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. We like to stand. We like to raise our hands. We like to worship. We just did it for the whole segment this morning while we sang. But I, I'm just, when's the last time we knelt down and put our face in the floor in honor of a holy God? Recognizing I, I'm not worthy to be here. I don't deserve this moment. He is so high and lifted up and I am, as David said, but a worm. Mm. 
Verse number seven, the Levites, and it lists them and labels them, instructed the people of the law while everyone remained in their places. They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. It was a a massive Bible study going on, everybody doing what they could to explain the book of the law. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were interpreting for the people said to them, Don't mourn or weep on such a day as this. For today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah continued and said, Go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a, a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I was raised in a wonderful church. I've mentioned it often in Massillon, Ohio. My pastor, my first 20 years of life was Pastor Harold Strange. And on a regular basis, I would hear this phrase from Pastor Strange. He'd be getting after us as Pentecostals and disciples and spirit-filled believers. We don't need to be walking around like you were baptized in lemon juice. Now, that's a graphic that has stuck in my mind for, yay, these 50-some years. You don't need to be walking around like you're baptized in lemon juice. That would be a modern take on what Nehemiah and Ezra are saying to this crowd. Even here in these few moments as I read this passage, we experienced the presence of God in the wonder of His Word and that appreciation but I didn't feel sad in those moments. I, I, I felt overwhelmed by his glory. Y'all with me? And there were those in that group that day, the Levites in verse 11, they ran around and said, look, don't weep, it's a sacred day. In verse 12, the people then left at the end of that meeting and they had a festive meal. They shared gifts of food to celebrate with great joy because they heard God's word and understood them. They heard God's word and understood them. The word of the Lord hadn't been accessible. It was not public in Babylon. So this occasion, as I already began to express, is a public reading. It's an explanation. It's in the city square. They're in charge of what happens that day. There, there's nobody going to come through Jerusalem and say, that's enough of God's word today. There's nobody going to clamp in on the crowd and say, you got too many folks gathered here in a public setting. You need to divide and separate. There was nobody going to restrict what was happening. It was left entirely to the audience and their desire for the Word of God. And in that setting, there was some overwhelming and some flood of emotions. And evidently, some folks just took to weeping. We aren't told why. We, we could assume they were overwhelmed. The word of God may be unaccustomed to some hearers. They had never heard something like that. Maybe it was just too much all at once. They had moved out of Babylon and back to Jerusalem. They were still setting up their households. They were still figuring out what schools to attend. They had been moving. They were figuring out how to reestablish their jobs. They're not slaves anymore. We're going to start trades and we're going to work farms. And there's a whole lot of things going on. And now they begin to hear this amazing amount of God's word. And it was like drinking from a fire hose, if you will. And it was so overwhelming to hear all of that coming on at the same time that perhaps some of them thought, my God, what am I going to do with all of this? They felt like it was too much. Maybe it was unattainable. Maybe it was too holy. Maybe I can't put all the words into it. We're left with maybes. Even the words of the series that we have shared, rest, peace, today, joy, 
It might seem out of reach for some of us. Maybe we consider those privileges, you know, it's going to be for somebody else to enjoy. It's for another time and another place. Maybe we see the powerful blessings that we've been talking about in Scripture and perhaps some of us would think and say, those are out of reach for me. Perhaps we would feel dejected and sad hearing about them. And even like Ezra and Nehemiah and the Levites as they're expounding in the Israelites to the Israelites in the square, you and I today in these moments and these days, we can hear the Word of God. We can understand the Word of God. And I, I come to preach today that the Word of God revealed in our minds and in our hearts and in our lives and in our understanding the truth and the power of God. It's not a time for mourning. It's not a time for sadness. Not a time to be dejected. Rather, when we are exposed to the pure, holy truth of God's Word, it's a time for celebration. It's a time for great joy. It's a time to realize that the Creator of heaven and earth is speaking wisdom that's available to me. He is sharing truth that I might know and understand and grow into. The flesh and our humanity and sinful nature and the enemy of our souls would whisper into our mind and spirit, well, that, I'm just not there. I'll, I'll never get to that replace. Uh, instead, our right response should be God. He's opening a door for me. He's inviting me to wonderful things. So Nehemiah said, go celebrate in verse 10 with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. It's a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy matters. Joy matters. Well, as long as I'm rested and strong enough to continue on, I don't care how happy or pleased or thrilled I am. I'm just here to toughen up and serve God. As long as I've got some inner peace, in other words, there's a settledness. So as long as there's a neutrality, as long as I'm not feeling emotional pain or distraughtness, I'll be okay. I'm here to preach that joy matters. I'm here to preach that when there is a lack of inspiration in my kingdom pursuit, I need to have joy reinstilled in my life. I need to have joy kindled and refired in my life. Do we need rest? Of course. Peace? Yes. But joy carries us. It's by joy that we walk through the challenges in our lives. It's by joy that we endure hardship in our lives. We move ahead. We carry on by joy. Joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Maybe we would do ourselves some good to memorize Nehemiah's words and wake up every morning quoting them to ourselves. This is a sacred day before our God. Don't be dejected and sad for the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That ought to be a way to start out every day. Okay, fine, preacher, settle down. You're yelling a little bit early in your message today. Now where, where do I find the joy of the Lord? Where is that? Where's the retail outlet of the Lord's joy store? Psalm 43 and verse 4. There I will go to the altar of God, to God, 
the source of all my joy. I will praise you with my harp, O God. My God, the source of all my joy. Uh, hear me today. We talked about finding rest in wrong areas. We talked about a human pursuit for peace in lesser areas. Can I share just very clearly? There are some that would desire joy. They're looking for joy. They're hoping for joy. They, they really have a need for joy in their lives. And for some reason think, I'll find it here. I'll find it there. I'll, I'll chase it where others are chasing it. I'll pursue it where it's being advertised elsewhere. But you ought to understand and know that God is the source of all joy. He is the source for you. You and I, and I, I here to make it plain, pursue the Lord God. First Chronicles, great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He's to be feared above all gods. The gods of other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and joy fill his Dwelling. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying you make it into God's arena. You, you get into the place where he's hanging out. And you can't help but feel strength and joy just getting close to God. Just, just getting near to him. There is joy in his dwelling. The psalmist said, Psalm 16, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. There's something about surrendering to the presence of God. There's something about getting in a place where God's Spirit is and allowing ourselves to be impacted by that. There are people who don't even realize all that's happening and yet they are being impacted by the power of God. You've seen it as well as I have. Folks that come into a Pentecostal church feeling the Spirit of God moving and the power of God sweeping through. All of a sudden they start mopping their eyes a little bit and they're, they're not blinking quite a bit more. They don't know all of what's going on. And as they're encouraged to say yes to Jesus, it's amazing how the Spirit of the Lord works in lives. It is powerful. And I say it time and again in a ministry that God's allowed me. I've preached in hundreds of churches across North America and in seven different countries around the world. And every time some Someone grasp hold of the Spirit of God when they're done praying. I never see anger. I never see bitterness. I never see them get up and kick an altar. No, I see them stand up and hug everybody that's nearby. I see them get up with a big old smile on their face, recognizing I, I don't can't explain everything that just happened. I can't give you the details and the dimensions, but I know, as Fook Chu used to say, something divine divine has happened to me that's the presence of God in his presence is fullness of joy in his presence fullness of joy hmm. Psalm and Chronicles these Old Testament testimonies they leave no questions we humans find supernatural joy in God, by God, with God. So anytime, this probably doesn't happen to any of you, but it hits me on occasion. Anytime bitterness starts creeping in and wedging, I need God. When frustration has me clenching my fists or my teeth, I need to be in His presence. If my kingdom inspiration begins to lag, 
I need the joy that surrounds him. Right now in that office on the whiteboard, there's a scripture that says, Don't be lazy, but be inspired by the Spirit. When I get some dullness in my kingdom pursuit, when I, I get some lack of inspiration, the, the answer is not to quit. The, the answer is to get in the presence of God. In His presence is fullness of joy. At His right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. If you believe that, if you know that, if you've experienced that, would you raise your hands and thank Him? Would you clap? your hands would you express to him in some way oh Lord I thank you for that freedom I thank you oh Lord for the joy I have in you I, I thank you oh Lord that I can be in your presence I thank you Lord for the way that your dwelling uh, overwhelms and inspires and brings joy into our lives <laughs> These Old Testament witnesses in David and in Jeremiah and the Psalms, they found their strengthening joy. I want you to hear something. Those testimonies David wrote in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand, pleasures forevermore. David enjoyed God around. David enjoyed God near him. David would enter into the temple and he began to sing like we were singing. He would begin to dance and he began to clap and raise his hands and show signs of surrender to God's presence. And he would be in that dwelling near the Ark of the Covenant and he would feel God's presence pressing up against him. He had that and still came away with that power in his presence, his fullness of joy. When David wanted to get a hold of God, he was finding a place where I can be near him. He was looking for a situation where I can get into his dwelling. In his presence, his fullness of joy, David would play the harp and entertain God's power. He would have that presence come near him. When he was worshiping in that harp and the presence of God was near, it would calm the bitterness and the rage in King Saul. There's something about the power of God being in His presence and it being around you. But in the New Testament, it's a different deal. We are not limited to God's presence simply around us. Because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus, we enjoy His joy in us. In Acts 13, 52, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Filled with joy and the Spirit of God. Not now just rubbing shoulders with God. Not now just being in some dwelling place where he's nearby. Not just seeing an angelic vision where, wow, I'm getting close to the fire of God's holiness right now. No, now it is inside. In Romans, Paul wrote in Romans 15, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 14, the kingdom of God's not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Galatians said the fruit, the offspring, the development of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. I remind us today, we've got New Testament revelation. Yes, I can feel the joy of God around me. Yes, I can be impacted by His Spirit near me. But what a privilege! I can have His joy inside of me. I can be filled with the righteous, holy presence of God. And in Him, I have joy inside. Yeah. 
We're filled with the Spirit. His joy resides in us. So when that joy needs recharged, I don't need to locate God. I need to surrender to Him. When I've been filled with the Spirit, I, I don't need to discover where God is. Where's His address again? Can I put that in Google Maps? His location, when I'm filled with the Spirit, is resident within me. It's not finding His dwelling place. I am His dwelling place. The joy recharge is in my allowing His Spirit to renew me again. I got to yield to Him. Last week, as I have now made a tradition, I like to pray on this side of the auditorium. I like to sit on this side of the auditorium. I'm not sure why. I should come over here and pester Mike and Marlene a little more. But I like to be on that side. And I tend to pray over there. I was praying last week. And I said, Lord, I want you to, Lord, saturate this service. In my mind, I envisioned, you know, like in the Old Testament, they talk about the Spirit of the Lord came in a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. You all with me? And that, that's what I had in my mind. I'm, I'm praying, Lord, if there's like a pillar of cloud of your Spirit, just kind of bring it on down. Oh, I want that kind of evident display of God's power. And as I'm praying, uh, I believe the Lord quickened my mind. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. Why am I praying for something to happen that's already guaranteed? Surely, among a gathering, there'll be at least two or three of us whose hearts are after the Lord. He's here. And so I'm praying and I'm thinking, Lord, then what's the difference? If you're here, then how come there are some services that, well, that was nice. And there are other services like, wow, what's heaven going to be like? How come there are some services where all my mind can think about is, is so-and-so singing in the right notes? Uh, did, did, did Brother Mark shake my hand when I came in today? Are they having children's ministry? And we leave and get in the car, and what are we having for dinner today? Why are some services like that? And other services where you just kind of want to hang around. I don't want to leave this place. I don't want to step away from what's happening right now in the kingdom of God. What's the difference? The difference is this. The percentage of us, the amount of us, the collective body allowing the spirit to move in us. Here's what happens. The greater the percentage in the audience of people who are anxious and inspired and building faith and open to the presence of God, the more we enjoy his glory. All of us walk in here at the same time and we're kind of distracted. We're thinking about other things and we're not paying attention. It's just going to be some songs and hopefully I can keep you from falling asleep with what I'm saying. But if we'll come in here saying, I know God is there. And I need to feel his joy. Well, I dare you, do it right now.
I dare you. As a body, as a group, I, I need to feel his presence. Are there some men and women who will say, you know what, yeah, that sounds good to me. In his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Oh, he's here. He has been here. He is in our midst. Will I reach out to him? Will I engage him? Will I open up my mind and open up my spirit? Will I say, yes, Lord, I, I, I need your power and your glory. That's it, Mom. That's it, Grandma. That's it, Elder. That's it, young one. That's it. Come on. That's exactly what needs to happen right now across this house. Those watching online, come on, just say, yes, I, I am open to how God would move right now. That's beautiful. Oh, the Spirit of the Lord. There is joy in the house right now. There is satisfaction and inspiration in the house right now. Come on, Grandpa. Come on, Mom and Dad. Come on, young adult. Would you just spend a moment? Come on. Reach out to Him. Uh, invite Him to saturate your mind and your spirit. Surrender yourself to the Spirit of God in you. Surrender yourself to the Spirit of God. Give me peace. You've been listening to the Living Faith Everett podcast series. Tune in next week for the next part of this series, or join us online at livingfaithministries.church. Go.